Good morning. Thank you for joining us um, for this panel early on Saturday morning, Harnessing Journalism for Justice in the Case of Murdered Journalists. My name is Courtney Raj. I'm the Advocacy Director at the Committee to Protect Journalists. And um, we use reporting as the basis for our advocacy to try to achieve justice. And one of the reasons that we know um, that justice in the murder of journalists is so difficult to achieve is because we've been systematically documenting the number of journalists, not just the number, but all of the details, the stories, the profiles of journalists who have been killed in their line of work, with more than 1,340 since 1992 killed, the majority of whom were murdered. So murder is the actually leading cause of death um, for journalists who lose their life on the job. And we also know that in nine out of 10 cases, the killers go free. So to some extent, the journalistic community has to take it upon itself to get justice. And we've seen some successes with that. Um, but it's also a long slog. So I am joined here by a stellar panel of um, journalists and press freedom advocates who are indeed harnessing journalism and using journalism to get justice, um, to pursue the truth. So on my right, Rachel Jolly is the editor of Index on Censorship. And I'm gonna start by asking you to tell us a little bit about what Index on Censorship does, because you published a magazine started back in 1972, um, which is, I think, one of the first examples of really trying to use journalism in this way. Um, yes, thank you, Courtney. So, um, for those of you who haven't seen, Index on Censorship magazine looks like this. It's an actual magazine. Remember those? They still exist. Um, and we think that they have a real value. Um, and what we find is, um, Actually, having a magazine has given us, we find it more powerful in some ways than uh, covering stuff, uh, stories on the web, and so we, we continue to, to value print. So I'll just put that out there at the beginning. Um, Index and Censorship magazine was set up in 1972 um, after a plea from writers in the what was then the Soviet Union, um, including Pavel Litvinov, to... Um, to publish their work at a time when they were unable to publish their writing in their own country. And they wrote to some writers, including Stephen Spender, the poet in London, and said, please help us. Um, we, we need our writing to be seen. And we continue to respond to that. And, and in that way, we, we are a platform for a magazine for censored writing. So we, we look for writers and journalists um, artists as well, who have uh, who are facing censorship in their own country. Um, some of them are also under enormous pressure. Some of them are imprisoned, um, and and publish their writing. And um, that side of what we do, we think, just giving um, a view to the world of of their writing can be um, can be powerful in itself. But it also gives. Um, gives a sense, as I keep, I keep talking to people who say, it's enormously important when the rest of the world is aware that something is going on. So we have a, a journalist in, uh, who's, who's uh, in our London office at the moment, um, um, and she is a Cameroonian journalist, and she, she said it feels like it, Cameroon right now, uh, no one else cares what's happening here. Uh, we don't get any sense that the world is watching. And uh, she's just won our journalism fellowship for this year. And one of the things that we will try and do is help bring more attention to um, what's happening, both to journalists in Cameroon, but also um, why journalists are under, under attack. And she's, she's under incredible pressure. She's been imprisoned. Um, she's now left the country. And she feels like if she returns to the country, she may well be arrested. Um, we also work with um, journalists in Mexico, and I think that is really relevant to what we're talking about today. Obviously, um, Me Mexico is an incredibly dangerous place for journalists, and um, we have continually published reports and journalism from Mexico looking at how journalists are living their lives, um, how, uh, how many journalists have been killed there, um, and, and just bringing attention to what's happening there and taking the, that information to authorities and saying, look, um, what are you going to do about that? 
Um, and I'll just mention one other thing, which is that we, um, for the last four and a half years, have been running a project called Mapping Media Freedom, um, and that covered attacks on journalists in 42 countries in Europe and around, uh, in neighboring countries around Europe, um, in all sorts of levels. So from journalists being murdered to um, different types of attacks, physical attacks, um, them having their work taken down and so on. So we, we cover using journalism and, uh, and publishing. Um, we, th that's kind of our platform for bringing world attention and using information to um, take to authorities like the Council of Europe and say, to, to call attention to uh, what's happening and say, what are you gonna do about this? Are there any examples? Um, can you give us an example of where you know that has been effective? Where you know any like a specific case where you know maybe there was not justice, there was not attention, and through covering it, through writing a story in the magazine or in the um, media monitoring index, that that was able to have an impact. It's. I think everybody here would probably say the same, same thing. It's incredibly hard to show kind of a, a single example, but we hear all the time that. Um, it's, a, it's about, it's kind of a war of attrition. It's like lots of different pressure points can make a difference. And what we've seen in Slovakia, um, following the killing of um, Jan Kuczek there, is the world attention on that um, killing has, I think, made an incredible difference to how the Slovakian government has, how it's responded. And, and, uh, and, and maybe, can you, can you talk a little, what, what was that response, right? You saw a uh, resignation um, of the Prime Minister. That's right. And, yeah. Yeah, so it, uh, corruption uh, that was happening in the country has been, you know, has come to light. Um, the, the government has changed. Uh, the, the public, there was lots of protests in the street. Um, we actually, we just covered in, in the magazine that just came out, um, we had two stories from Slovakia. And uh, they were quite both uh, from Slovakians who were, relatively optimistic that you know things were potentially moving in the right direction in terms of transparency in terms of corruption and that things hopefully uh, would continue to go in that way so you know the fact that there has been um, an investigation a meaningful investigation some convictions as well as high level political resignations in Slovakia is pretty rare um, and it certainly contrasts with what we've seen in Malta. Um, in Malta, where Daphne Caruana Galizia, um, they have identified a couple of the people that they think um, cre set off the car bomb, but certainly have not identified the mastermind um, in a mission that, that the community to protect journalists did, along with um, several other organizations on the one-year anniversary of her murder, um, hearing from the Prime Minister and the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General that there's no timeline, uh, that there's an independent investigation, but there are no um, touch points at which they can really see what is the status um, and, and seeming real lack of political will uh, to find who murdered uh, this investigative journalist and blogger. So, Laurent, uh, Richard, who is the founder and director, director of Freedom Voices Network and um, the <coughs> conceptualized an idea of using journalism to continue and, and networking of journalists to continue some of the investigations and created the Daphne Project. So can you tell us about the Daphne Project specifically but also more broadly this approach of continuing the work? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the Daphne Project was um, a cross-border investigation with uh, 45 journalists and 18 news organizations who were part of that uh, global and collaborative effort uh, with uh, the very same idea, I think, that uh, Index of Censorship has that uh, continuing the work uh, using journalism to defend journalism. And um, Daphne was investigating very important topic, uh, not only for the Maltese public opinion, but for the European opinion or the worldwide opinion because she was investigating money laundering and she was investigating corruption, so involving uh, money from Azerbaijan, UK-based uh, UK company, Dubai-based company. So it was very important that w um, to set up a, 
an international group of reporters and news organization to continue the work of Daphne to, with uh, two goals, investigating the killing on one end, but on the other end to continue the important work she did, whether it was about um, the setting of passport or, or other critical topics. So we, uh, we were working for six months like this um, with, uh, with Reuters, with The Guardian, with uh, Le Monde, with Zudan uh, Chazaitung. In Italy, it was, um, we were working and very happy to work with the IRP, Investigative Report Reporting Project Italy, and uh, La Repubblica. And I can show you, if you want, a, a two-minute video that is summarizing um, what, um, what this group did. I don't know if... Uh, yeah. Daphne Carana Galizia killed when a bomb exploded. Connected to the aggressive work she had done calling out corruption in Malta. Forbidden Stories was created as a platform to protect stories of silenced journalists. Threatened journalists can back up their sensitive information through one of our encrypted channels. Their stories will be held securely in case something happens. Forbidden Stories will be able to access the stories, complete them thanks to its partners, and reveal it broadly. The first Forbidden Story was about Daphne. We coordinated the work of 45 journalists to review a massive number of files in a complete secrecy and complete Daphne's investigations with one common objective, revealing what her killers wanted to hide. Six months after her death, we hit the news. An internationalist consortium of journalists is scrutinizing Malta as part of the so-called Daphne project. In one day and for weeks, Daphne's stories made the headlines all over the world. Forbidden Story is an international network of journalists designed to finish these stories and the investigations that we've worked in. In a week, hundreds of millions of people have been potentially exposed to Daphne's stories, dramatically increasing the number of readers of her blog. This is how a local investigation became an international affair. Commission will pursue this. We will keep pushing the Maltese authorities. We will keep pushing them. No stone should remain unturned. Today, we gave Daphne a new voice, and as long as journalists will be threatened, jailed, or killed, we will keep stories alive. So, yeah, this is um, just uh, some just, uh, explanation about what we did on the Daphne project regarding forbidden stories. We, we created this. Uh, platform for thinking that when a journalist gets killed, uh, when he gets jailed, or when he gets arrested, it's uh, most of the time because he is supposed to, he's working on a very important uh, story or he's about to publish a very important story. So we, we, our goal is really to make sure that this information will reach the audience, will reach the public. And, um, but also it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a journalistic organization, but with uh, one objective also to dissuade the killers to to, um, to kill the messenger and to, um, to, to tell them that uh, even if they try to kill the messenger, they will never kill the message. And the, one of the main ideas, so it's to amplify the message that the, the case or the story they w or the crimes they wanted to hide in La Valette in Malta or in Baku in Azerbaijan, we, we will expose this very same crime and investigate this crime and publish uh, these stories in New York, in Paris, in Nairobi and everywhere. So that's something I think we um, journalists Journalism can be very useful to defend journalism by, by exposing and shedding the light of something that some people, some organization wants really to, uh, to hide. And sometimes we did see that when some autocrats uh, like Hidam Aliyev in Azerbaijan, they are controlling really the media landscape, of course, in their own countries. But when they are traveling abroad and when they are meeting the French presidency or traveling in, in Germany, it's always very useful to ask the question that local journalists cannot ask anymore there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of international pressure coming from um, foreign reporters can really make a difference because they can really be a little bit more afraid by this uh, question in a, with a, a lot of cameras and much more free press around mm -hmm. them. And, and what about um, the Project Deadly Border, which is investigating the kidnapping and murder of Ecuadorian journalists? 
Yeah, that was a project uh, started by 21 journalists in Ecuador and Colombia last, last year after the killing of three persons, one journalist, one photographer, and the driver. Uh, they were killed, they were kidnapped, and then killed um, while they were investigating um, drug trafficking uh, on the border between Ecuador and Colombia. And um, those journalists, uh, the, a group of 21 journalists wanted to continue the work and to investigate the killing of their friends and colleagues. And so we, with other organizations like OCCRP, uh, Forbidden Stories, joined this project and to, to, to support the project and to send reporters over there. And we, um, so we did the same thing. We, uh, we sent one reporters and we, we published our stories in The Guardian, Le Monde, and many other newspapers. And that's, um, I think, yeah, what <coughs> we, well, the really the, the facing that kind of global threats against journalists, we really need a kind of global answer. And thanks to the success of uh, ICAJ and OCCRP or ELC on uh, large investigation on for the general interest, I think now the, the private meeting is uh, really changing in the newsroom that we do accept to collaborate much more than 10 years before. 10 years or 15 years before you can be fired for sharing information with your colleague. And uh, now it's, uh, uh, it's uh, we are not in the same uh, situation. And so I, th I think it's uh, collaboration can also bring some kind of protection. When you, uh, if some autocrats or some enemy of the, of the free press start understanding that the targeted journalist is not really alone, but it can be connected or is connected with other newsroom, other international newsroom, that will be uh, a very counterproductive idea to make any kind of attempt because they will amplify the, 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 the exposure of their crimes. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, you know, a couple of key thoughts in there. Global threats require global networks and global response. Um, and that collaboration can be a form of protection. Um, we're gonna talk about w security and, and how do we keep reporters safe so that they don't end up there um, with Stefan. But before we get there, I wanna talk a little bit about how the Committee to Protect Journalists uses journalism to protect and, and get justice for journalists. So I brought a map, y'all are welcome to have it. But we can see just very quickly, you don't need to see the details, but these are the the journalists killed and imprisoned around the world. Okay, so there's a lot of them. Suffice to say, the past three years have seen record numbers of journalists jailed for their work and historic levels of journalists murdered. We, um, similar with the, OC you mentioned OCCRP, if everyone, it's the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. So we took a similar approach in the Ukraine where we went to investigate the investigation into the murder of journalist Pavel Sheremet. Um, we figured, let's report on the status of investigation. Similarly, we did that in Malta. We did that in Mexico with a, a, several journalists um, where impunity was still the case to report on the status of investigations. And sadly, what we found, and which OCCRP also found in Ukraine, is that there are massive gaps in the investigation. Um, and But part of the only way that we're gonna know that is if we go out and report on what, what is happening with these investigations, because it's, certain, it's not like the authorities are going to be forthcoming with that information. Um, we're also taking that to the United States. So there was a, a music journalist blogger um, who was murdered in Chicago named Zachary Stoner. And in April, after less than I think a year since his killing, they just called it a cold case. And there are a lot of young black men who are murdered um, by guns in Chicago. But we want to know, is this related to his journalism? It's very important to know that. Um, and so we're going to be, we're working with a partner in Chicago to do some investigations into what happened. Um, and, you know, I'll just share this book that we put out, um, which is, you know, I think goes to this idea that um, if you kill a journalist, you're not going to be able to silence them this is the last column of 24 journalists out of the 1,340 who have been killed since 1992. Um, that really, it's, it's very evocative if you read through it to see what the last thing that they wrote about was. In some cases, it was about the war in Syria, for example, Marie Colvin. Um, in other cases, like Jamal Hashoki, about the importance of press freedom in the Arab world. 
and another Sri Lankan journalist who was writing about how dangerous it is to be a journalist in Sri Lanka and how he might lose his life, and then he did. Um, it's, so it really emphasizes the, the, the dangers that journalists face, but also to remind, I think, to, to let people know that it's the journalists, <coughs> their people, they have families, um, and the loss of what, you know, the loss, their loss to society and the impact that that has um, on the public's right to know, on their ability to know about corruption in Malta, about the link with Azerbaijan, you know, about um, the dangers facing journalists in Mexico. And so I want to turn now to Stefan Candia, who's the co-founder and coordinator of the European Investigative Collaborations, because we don't only want to be investigating after a journalist is attacked or killed or um, imprisoned, but we also want to be thinking about what can we do proactively um, to keep them safe. And so you're doing these complex investigations that often take more than a year, um, and you have to, you know, really think about safety and security. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Maybe grab that mic. <coughs> sure, thanks. So I think I can explain that <coughs> by giving a bit of background. Uh, I come from Romania and um, I grew up with in professionally uh, doing investigative journalism and uh, reaching out of the country to other journalists and activists uh, <coughs> exactly for this reason, for um, building a sort of uh, protection net around um, what I was doing and what our colleagues were doing. So Romania was <coughs> uh, a safe country in a way. You don't get uh, a journalist killed, but you we had uh, problems uh, with journalists being beaten, imprisoned. And so um, I think my approach was <coughs> more um, uh, proactive um, in a way. Uh, we did things like uh, mapping the ownership of the media in Romania. So I think m m what I want to say first, I, I focus on the local um, uh, uh, local landscape, let's say, um, <coughs> and then <coughs> I was also connecting uh, things internationally. So we, we, we approached this pretty systematic, so we, we investigated the media landscape basically and uh, produce a mapping of ownership that we try to keep up to date. Uh, it's, it's a project that we, we didn't update for a long time now, but that was uh, showing you who actually owns the media and what uh, what are their other businesses that actually make them uh, uh, media owners. And you could see their dependency uh, on, on government and uh, public funds. Um, <coughs> we were involved in a close collaboration with a local um, uh, group called Active Watch, which is sort of Reporters Without Borders, but focused only for Romania. So with them together, we, we were keep keeping them informed about issues that investigative journalists have, and then we would uh, work together to even propose legislation or react when something bad was happening to journalists. Um, for instance, there were journalists uh, arrested because they, um, they, they uh, published information about a military map of military operations in Afghanistan, um, but uh, uh, just for the fact that they own that uh, CD with, uh, with the information, they were uh, arrested. So <coughs> we <coughs> went in front of the prosecution office and organized a fair of um, yeah, secret information exchange. So basically we, 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 we invited other journalists to bring secret information and, and uh, share it with the other journalists. So just to make a point that it's not the journalist's job to protect the military secrets. Um, and so <coughs> we, we did this, this kind of uh, things and also informed Active Watch, who is, I think, I don't know of any other organization doing this at the local level. They produce a very um, detailed report every year called the Quiex Report that uh, lists all the abuses against uh, journalists and freedom of speech, among other things like legislation, uh, media market, and so on. But it's important to document that because now you look at 20 years of these reports, who unfortunately are only in Romanian. Um, but you look at all these reports and you can actually see how the uh, situation evolves. You can have a point of departure if you, are, if you want to research uh, what happens with uh, specific journalists at specific uh, points in time. And <coughs> I, I tell you this um, because I think as important as these international organizations are, you need an ecosystem and that ecosystem needs to have uh, uh, similar local actors because you have many different uh, political contexts, many different, different languages, 
and for instance, you cannot, um, uh, you could be uh, an, uh, a support network for similar organizations, but you will never be able to work around the globe um, and do like uh, um, uh, do this kind of uh, work everywhere, like Forbidden Stories, for instance. If you don't have the local language, you inform you with the uh, local language and so on. So for that reason, um, I, I was uh, uh, joining Reporters Without Borders and become a correspondent for them. I mean, been a correspondent <coughs> for the last, last 18 years and try to sort of uh, make a bridge between local information and international uh, organization. So <coughs> uh, w when it comes to our own uh, uh, stories, Obviously, I, I worked in, in a, a region that had uh, and has huge problems. We, uh, I, I started working in journalism uh, when colleagues were talking about the Gongadze murder in uh, Ukraine. Then there were so many killings that, they, uh, uh, that affected colleagues in Russia and uh, violent attacks around in Moldova, Bulgaria, um, and uh, Serbia. So the whole region was always uh, a place where if you go somewhere to research and to do investigations, you need to talk about security. And that's something that was sort of part of our DNA. Um, we always discuss that with colleagues and try to arrange our own um, uh, security in terms of letting other people know on a regular basis where we enter, where we go, uh, um, uh, who we meet. And this is this, the sharing of the, of the information was key. Also making clear to people we work with that there are other colleagues who have access to that information, so there are not no uh, lone wolves uh, out there, and uh, making clear that that information is shared with, with others, even in cases when it was not, a, not true. Um, and so when we set up now um, work with uh, EIC, um, EIC it's a consortium, it's a, it's a network of uh, media partners, and there are staffers who work in Western Europe, in a, uh, pretty safe uh, place, but there are also journalists from Eastern Europe who work with, uh, with um, researching stories. So we do discuss uh, security and all, mostly it's about digital security and the secrecy and the protection of the data, <coughs> the data to protect the source, but also the journalist and the story. Um, and from time to time we have to discuss uh, security uh, in the field. And then my take on it is that we approach it on a case by case, uh, um, on only on a case by case uh, um, basis, and we don't have uh, like uh, written gui guidelines that we apply for each in the same in the same way, because I think that is not the right approach. Because it, obviously situations change and evolve, um, also on the technology side, of course, but also in in terms of uh, field uh, research. So I'm hearing, um, you know, both with Forbidden Stories um, and with the work that EIC is doing and, you know, something that we've recognized at CPJ and I'm sure Index as well, this issue of digital security and the issue um, of collaboration. But then also I heard you talk about, you know, the, the longevity of reporting on attacks on the press, which is, I think, interesting, you know, looking back to 1972 with the magazine, CPJ was founded in 1981, You're talking about 20 years of this documentation, and that it's really only through that, the longevity of that reporting that you can see the types of trends that are happening yeah. to the media environment. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, I think that's really important. And one of the, we have this amazing archive of everything that we've ever published from 1972. And we've tried to put together um, different, uh, different sort of reading lists almost for different subjects. But it is incredibly interesting that you can trace some of the development of these trends. Um, and also, sometimes you, you can read something from 1981 and it feels like something that you could publish tomorrow. You know, I was reading a piece by Umberto Eco that we published this week and I thought, <coughs> actually, I could put that up tomorrow and people would probably think that was new. You know, and so I, I think there is something really valuable about looking back and um, learning the lessons of what happened previously, because these things come around, you know, and, they, and to see how people um, dealt with that, the situation. Um, we've been doing a, some pieces looking at um, com comparisons with 89 in Europe um, and um, the Prague Spring and so on. Um, but 
we also put together sort of uh, reading this on um, attacks on uh, musicians or uh, methods of censorship and um, they can be really valuable for academics and students but also um, in putting together a wider picture and the other thing I wanted to mention was I think that that, that the way um, one of the things we tried to do with both mapping media freedom and the magazine is trace um, cut across borders which is you know spot trends that are evolving in one particular country so um, Mexico for instance was very early in bring in in using um, national funded bots to discredit um, journalists <coughs> way ahead of what we've seen you know over the last five years we've seen that come up as a technique but um, we saw that happening in Mexico we saw that happening quite early in Turkey and putting that together and showing um, these things are you know, growing as global trends because quite often people tend to follow the news through a specific country. And I think uh, we've increasingly seen with national leaders how they're copying each other. And I think it's really important for journalists and people who are um, showing what's happening in journalism to see, to also have those kind of resources. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's a great point. And you also, you know, emphasize the importance of um, the local view and but also being able to pull that up to a global level. I mean, I think what's very interesting here is um, and, and what our data shows, I mean, nine out of 10 journalists murdered are local journalists. The vast majority of journalists in prison are local journalists. And it's those local journalists who are telling the stories on the ground. But then there's the power of the amplification through the global. So. Laurent, can you talk a little bit about whether you think that this is leading to justice? Is it, do we have to think about justice only through a judicial system or are we looking at justice in a different way? Well, it's a combination of course, because we, we were talking about this, the case in Slovakia, but if we compare to what, what's happening, uh, after the murder of uh, Daphne in Malta, you can see kind of uh, the opposite, that there is, a, as you, the mastermind is still free, the three people arrested not, are not talking, uh, there is a total impunity, uh, there is no time frame for the investigative, uh, uh, judicial, uh, um, uh, the, investi the official investigation, sorry. And so, yeah, I think that on, on our end we can do a lot, but we cannot do that alone. Uh, so that's why it's um, our reporting, our publication are so important to so to to put pressure on the shoulders of the, on the political um, level that they need to investigate the killing of their of the journalists and uh, and more specifically on Malta, it's happening in um, in Europe, and um, I really still don't understand how you can be a, Europe, a member state. And, uh, and organize that kind of impunity in your own countries, but pretending in the same time that you are sharing the value of European Union. That's, that's, a, that's a point. And that's a point also for the European Union system, that uh, how, um, how to uh, make sure that uh, your members will uh, comply with the rules of freedom of information and the basic, basic things. So, so yes, of course, we cannot do that alone. We are just journalists. We are not uh, uh, policemen or judge and we are just working for the general interest. But I, yeah, I think it's, um, what we need to so show is, is we need to, uh, what we are observing in the last, for, regarding the trend, you, you were mentioning the boards and, and, and what's, um, I was uh, attending the talk of Maria Ressa from the Philippines, from Rappler. She was describing the troll, the, the troll campaign happening against her it, and, uh, and the, the investigation they did on the Twitter account who were the same using in, in Russia, the same using for the French election. So there is really kind of a industrialization, uh, information warfare, very violent, uh, making the harassment much more uh, powerful in a way. And, uh, and, and we see governments using that, uh, the, those, um, those campaign on Twitter against journalists mm -hmm. to uh, make them an arrest of the very same journalists. Mm -hmm. So um, we, and this is coming also because of, of the distrust between the public opinion and the journalists. And this is, um, I think, probably the most challenging things we are facing, that's how to regain trust, because we, So, so yeah. does, DAF, does, the DAF, does something like the Daphne Project help rebuild trust? Yeah, I think in a way, by, 
the work I think um, EIC is doing, we are, we are re-explaining by doing that what journalism is about, for who we are working for. Sometimes in France, in Paris, I can have some discussion with people who think that journalists are working for, are partisan, or they are, mm -hmm. since they are part of a, a corporation, private corporation, they are working from some private interest. So we need to re-explain that we are working for the public interest, and when we do investigate tax avoidance, it's about um, the money and the funds that are missing for building schools and hospitals for all the kids mm -hmm. in that country. So that's for the public mm -hmm. interest. Mm -hmm. I, we've also done some work with uh, the Carunia Galizia family. And one of the things that I found really powerful, so um, uh, being on various panels with Paul in the UK, is, is opening people's eyes to Malta as a country. For a lot of British people particularly, they think as Malta is this lovely country where everything is beautiful and, you know, they see it as cuddly and, mm. and the, you know, they can't imagine these things are going on. Uh, and we did one session in Wales where people just came up to us and had said, you know, afterwards, they had no idea that any of this was happening in, in Malta, you mm. know, that Malta could be like this. And I think there's something that is a very strong story, you know, that Malta has put itself out there as this beautiful haven, almost. Mm. And to, to show people and to, to tell a different story to people, but you have to reach them, you know. And so we did some work sh showing sort of tourist paradises and saying, actually, they look like this on, on, up front, but underneath, like with the Maldives is another example, really frightening things are going um, on underneath. And to put that in a kind of context of a travel, almost like a travel guide, and speak to those people who, who have no, who maybe just would ignore those kind of stories on the news, I think it, it can be a really yeah, sure. uh, powerful argument and bring different people, uh, raise the awareness of different people to what is actually going on which is a form of maybe alternative justice, right? So we've got, you know, the challenges of legal, you know, official forms of justice, but looking at, okay, well, how can we at least raise the awareness? We wanna go back to the local global nexus. And, you know, one of the things um, an Indian journalist said to me recently is that sometimes the local press can't really cover something until a, a global outlet or an international organization covers something, and then that kind of provides permission, that provides some cover for them to then cover it. It was about this, um, we are, we have a, a international partnership, the One Free Press Coalition, where basically like Forbes and Reuters and, and AP have all agreed to publish this 10 most urgent cases list um, and, of journalists who are under threat every month. And one of them is Rana Ayub in India. And so, you know, she was having trouble getting the press to cover those issues. And then once this list came out, which is, you know, global um, organizations creating this list, it, it kind of provided an opportunity for the India press. And you just saw an article yesterday talking about, you know, with elections coming up in India and journalists under attack you know, can, can we have democratic elections? Which I think is really interesting. So in Romania, do you get the sense that, you know, are you able to cover the issues you want? Do you think that, you know, that's, do you see that as a dynamic um, in, in, in your country and, and where you're working with the IEC? Well, this is a dynamic. I, th I think it's uh, valid um, all over, or was valid all over Eastern Europe, this dynamic of if you cannot publish something, uh, share it with someone outside the country and then if, if it's covered by international media it will be covered by national media as well that's working also if you have a local story in one city and you cannot publish there talk to someone uh, in the bigger city that, that runs uh, national media and then that gets to be published also locally so that's that's the dynamic I, I see um, indeed but of course, there is a lot of um, uh, self-censorship, and self-censorship exists for reasons: ownership of the media, or the political pressure on the different, uh, on the on the different media actors, or the joint venture between the owners of media who are there uh, just to protect uh, their business with with public funds. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying you need this kind of information to understand the context, why that uh, situation exists and how that situation can, can change uh, over, over time. And I think you can only have that by uh, trying to find a model that can be multiplied at different levels instead of trying to figure out a model where um, there is some sort of global thing that can uh, scale to the whole world. Mm -hmm. 
And um, unfortunately, what I see uh, is, is, there is there is less and less uh, local organizations like that. Like you see the disappearing of local journalism, I witnessed the disappearing of local activism and local organizations. I see that this is a, um, a, a big problem because then you'll have a f only the few big actors, international actors, and there will be no uh, feedback from, or no input uh, from the local level. And that means you will be taken by surprise uh, more often uh, and hear about things happening instead of uh, hearing the alarm bells uh, or the alerts that things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Say something on that. Yeah. Um, we just did a, a big report um, in the latest magazine about the value of local journalism. I think it's so important and something that's been unacknowledged in a way is that as we're seeing this global decline of local journalism and um, for many people it, it's been something that they haven't really cared about but um, the loss of that means there's so much more power in, uh, in the authorities' hands potentially to to control what, what the message is, but also f for those stories not to be covered. So um, in China, a lot of local newspapers are being closed, and partly it's financial, that same, you know, the, the advertising has gone to the internet s situation, but a lot of it is also because the Chinese government wants to close down the uh, amount of information that's going to the public and um, control the media. In Hungary, we've seen the local um, newspapers being basically bought up by Orban and friends of Orban so that they can, they're almost echo chambers of themselves. And, um, in, and then at the same time, we're seeing this bid to kind of discredit the international news, which um, is coming from the Law and Justice Party, for instance, from Orban, to say anybody who is involved with an international organization or has taken international money to um, help keep their newspaper or magazine or media going is somehow unpatriotic. So right, I think which it's is like exactly also what happened in the case with Mar with Maria Ressa, right? She's sure. facing charges in the Philippines because she had ex some external investors in her news organization. Yeah. But it's classic, isn't it? It's used. It's being used everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's try and undermine the power of the international voices while taking away local voices at the same time. So it's like a, it is a two pronged attack. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you might even say it's a three-pronged attack if you look at what happened with Jamal Khashoggi, because I think that it really was an unprecedented type of murder um, and silencing because, you know, he was working in, I mean, in Washington, D.C., you know, writing commentary and, uh, you know, had decided to self-impose exile from Saudi Arabia. He was murdered in Turkey, but in the Saudi consulate, which is technically Saudi land. It's, you know, as we are trying to um, pursue justice, we have to even ask ourselves, what does that look like? What does justice look like when you have that sort of three, you know, tripartite situation? What is the role of the international community? Um, and, you know, to your point about the decline of local journalism, you know, when we look at, say, Chicago in the United States, you know, we're seeing it around the United States as well, um, the decimation of local journalists and local journalism, um, which has profound impact, obviously. Um, I don't think we need to tell anyone that. But I do want to um, leave time for questions. So I believe there is a microphone and, or not even questions, also comments. I see people in the audience who have experiences you know, in um, countries around the world, including some that are very dangerous for journalists. If you'd like to share your own perspective, you're welcome to. So is there anyone who wanted to make a comment? Thanks. And please introduce yourself and let us know what country, what news outlet or, or otherwise you come from. Hello, <laughs> I'm Sylvia Lauder. I'm a Czech journalist. I work for a weekly magazine called Respect. Um, I have a question about how important is the support of the public and how can that be demonstrated? I'm sorry, I came late, so I probably didn't hear your bit about the Jan Kuciak murder where you could see a massive public response to his murder. But then on the other hand, we don't only, as a journalist, we also uh, not only need to be able to work safely and freely, but we also need to eat. <laughs> so would you say that you could actually see people transforming this support into actually subscribing your work? And how, how important is this? Obviously, it is important, but do you actually see it happening around the world that people would transform their support into subscribing uh, the newspaper. Thank you. 
Well, why don't you, I mean, what do you see in Romania? What do you see in your network? I don't, it's a perfectly valid point before, uh, before working safely, you need to be able to work. Um, so, uh, and that's unfortunately um, uh, harder and harder uh, in Romania and in Eastern Europe. It's, um, it's, 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 it's a, um, I don't know, the last three decades were like a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of uh, journalists uh, and working and publishing stuff in the early 90s, but then that declined uh, steeply in the last years, I think. So um, I don't see this translating in any way of uh, sub financial support like subscribing. Maybe it's also because the um, uh, independent uh, journalists uh, or independent uh, groups running away from mainstream commercial uh, media, they, and, uh, me included, uh, we took this path of the non-profit uh, where we went for grants more than uh, trying to figure out how can we actually have uh, people paying for our work. Um, so I, I see this, this, is, this is a problem. I see people approach this differently. For instance, Reporters Without Borders, they publish this uh, photo album uh, every year, right? And they put it in the hypermarket, in a hypermarket chains, <clears throat> and people buy it. And that is, um, that is going into the budget of the organization, partially. So uh, there are a lot of ways. I, 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 cannot, say, I cannot say I've seen that in uh, Romania. Rachel or um, I th Just back to the question of the, sorry, of the support of the public and what we have seen in Slovakia compared to Malta where some protests were organized in the street in Malta in support of Joseph Muscao, so uh, after the publication or after information. So um, to, to make the people subscribing to news outlets we first have them really to convince, to believe in journalism, and to, to start the conversation from scratch again, I think. And um, just, I was back again to the Maria Ressa talk yesterday or two days ago. She was explaining that some Facebook posts were coming from kids who were 12 years old, insulting very violently Maria Ressa. And, um, and those very young people, 12 years old, they didn't know what they were writing, but they were just violent. And so it's, it's, it's now, with all the, what's happening on Twitter with the trolling campaign against journalists, it's, uh, it's, uh, we, have, we are facing a very strong problem with a new generation of kids arriving and thinking that um, some, some regime can be violent against um, a journalist, or journalist is fake news, or organization have fake news. So there is a... Um, there is a lot of effort we have to do and, and our journalists, we have to be part of this in schools to re-explain for who we are working for, why it's important, um, to take some short example to compare what is happening in a country uh, where there is no more freedom of the press. Take the Turkey example and explaining what is happening over the five, six last years, for instance, and having some easy example of uh, what's going on when, when journalism is not a part anymore of the national conversation. I think we've, we've seen a, a deliberate um, attention to this by um, national leaders to undermine, I mean, clearly yeah. we've seen, um, I mean, Trump's the obvious example, but it's, it's a, a, another worldwide trend, isn't it, to undermine the relationship between the public and the media. And so, therefore, if it is disconnected, if, if the public feel less confident that the media are working for them, they, the combination of the public and the media is obviously a strong one, but if you pull them apart, then it, it, it becomes less powerful. I think we've also seen, I mean, I'm, I'm, as I said, I was working on this uh, local, uh, the, the power of the local press um, report recently, and looking for examples of, of um, entrepreneurs or new projects that were actually doing well, because clearly it's, it's there's so many that are closing, and. There, there are examples there. Um, so there's one in the UK called the Bishop Storford Independent. It's a new local newspaper. It's doing really well. It's putting readership on. It's taking on new staff. Uh, there's another um, newspaper in Oregon that's doing the same thing. So it, they've done, what they've done is they've, they've gone back to basics. I, you know, I was saying to them, what is the, what's, what's the thing that you're doing that's different? And they, they were saying, you know, we're covering courts. We're covering 
crime, we're doing, we're doing like the, the grind stuff that basically a lot of local journalists um, sort of forgot or moved away from because it's the most expensive, but also it's the thing that's also the most important, I think, in, in the connection with democracy. Yeah, and I think to your, if you don't have the public support, it becomes very more dangerous to be a journalist. I worked in Egypt and, um, you know, it was, it was not a great place to be a journalist, but I think most of the threats came from the state when I was there. Um, you know, they would occasionally jail a journalist, like it was, you know, not an easy place to work. But now, um, well, last time I was there, um, you know, hearing from reporters, I was doing a, a press freedom mission, you know, about they can't even walk out with a camera or a notepad because they'll be attacked by the public. Yeah. Right. So I think that's, you know, we're even in the United States where we're seeing um, at, you know, protests or at campaign rallies that journalists are being um, targeted and attacked, not just by, you know, police, but by protesters and by the public and by all sides who want to control their stories. So I think that's critical. I think we have time for one more question or comment if there is one. Oasis. Um, just, just a comment. Great, Can you introduce great, yourself? A great panel. My name is Oasis Aslam Ali. I'm from Pakistan Press Foundation. Um, just wanted to share the experience of, of Pakistan, uh, where local coverage has made a great uh, difference in, uh, in, in uh, highlighting attacks on, 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 on journalists. Um, in 2015, uh, the, the um, um, editors and the director news of all leading newspapers and um, television houses joined together uh, on a single point agenda of safety of journalists, and they decided that an attack on any one media house will be considered an, as an attack on all media houses. And so uh, after that, and they formed this network called Editors for Safety Network. And whenever there was an attack on a journalist, uh, all the television channels would start uh, uh, pretty much blanket coverage of breaking news and uh, till that attack ended. And pretty, it, it, it worked very well. And in all cases, uh, higher authorities would step up immediately. Uh, in one case, a journalist was picked up and generally, when somebody disappears, you find the body. But because of this um, blanket coverage by the media, uh, he was removed. Uh, he was uh, returned in, uh, in, uh, in the evening. Uh, as far as the rapid reaction is concerned, this has worked quite well. But just before uh, this meeting in Barcelona last week, the editors met again. And this time, they decided that they would now uh, work on ending impunity. And over 73 journalists have been killed in Pakistan, 50 of them targeted and murdered. And so they have now decided that they will take on uh, the cases, uh, and all of them will take on the cases of uh, journalists who have been murdered. And uh, for example, on May 3rd, on the anniversaries of things, they are going to ask the question. So uh, rapid reaction has been successful. Uh, let's hope and pray that the impunity, it makes a dent on impunity as well. That's really exciting. Yeah. I mean, I remember you telling me um, that before this editor safety network started that the newspapers wouldn't even report the name of the news outlet because they didn't want to somehow give publicity to that news outlet and to see such a major shift. I mean, I think that is, you know, a huge evidence of not only going back to this question, the importance of public support, but the importance of journalistic solidarity. And maybe I can just conclude the panel because I'm seeing that we have one minute left. Um, just to end on that note, you know, I think one of the things that I've heard on this panel and that we that we know from working here, the is emblematic of forbidden stories of you know an investigative collaboration like where you're working and with Index on Censorship, which is doing you know all of this work to support journalists and, and raise their voices, is the importance of solidarity. We can't achieve justice. We can't keep ourselves safe as journalists if we're not all in this together. So with that, let me conclude and just thank you for coming. Thank you, our panelists. And if anyone wants a map, there are some up here. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Hope that worked out OK. <laughs>
Yeah, please, there's, yeah. I really don't want to take them home.